uh, let's begin. And um, uh, everybody knows me. I hope uh, my name is John Henry. I'm chairman of the Committee for the Republic. And <clears throat> the question that uh, we ask ourselves um, frequent, frequently is why does the Committee for the Republic uh, uh, bestow Defender of Liberty Awards uh, on whistleblowers? And uh, the answer is uh, a simple answer. It's perjury. Um, and that may sound harsh, uh, but uh, perjury, I think, is the, is the correct word. And uh, uh, when members of, of Congress violate the oath of office, the uh, Constitution uh, is turned upside down. And we've, we've lost our way. Uh, our nation hasn't, uh, uh, was recently in Plymouth Rock, and uh, they actually carved the, uh, new, uh, the, uh, the 1620 in the rock. And, and, uh, and they said that uh, the nation was was founded on this rock, and uh, you know I had a little sign. And but our, our nation wasn't founded on Plymouth Rock; it was founded on the Constitution, and it was uh, forged by fifty five uh, delegates at the Constitutional Convention, and uh, we ended up with thirty nine signatories. And um, I, you know, it's our belief that this reflects the greatest accumulation of philosophical wisdom and practical politics. Um, in history, uh, in the history of government. Now, the Constitution didn't uh, create uh, co-equal branches. This is a, um, a, a big misunderstanding. Nothing could be further than the truth. Congress uh, was envisioned as the Republic's dominant branch, and it wields 18 enumerated powers, whereas executive only uh, has three. Uh, tonight, we're going to uh, be uh, awarding <clears throat> Defender of Liberty Awards to three veterans who blew the whistle on America's most recent wars of aggression in Afghanistan and Iraq. To Danny Davis, uh, Danny's surgeon, and, and Matt Howe, doubt that the war power uh, is government's most important power? Uh, do they have any doubt that government power is most abused in war? Uh, my colleague, uh, Bruce Fine, uh, our vice chairman, uh, I think eared in likening uh, Congress to um, an inkblot. He's also likened it to a rubber stamp. Um, uh, I think he was too laudatory. Um, uh, <clears throat> Congress is uh, a scientist dream of a perfect vacuum, a volume that contains no matter whatsoever. But the fault uh, doesn't is not in is not in our stars, but is in ourselves. For our supporting uh, political parties and candidates that have taken a wrecking ball to our constitution, our vertical plunge. From a republic glorifying liberty to an empire glorifying the global projection of military power, of course, is taboo. We are blind to what all the world can see. By orders of magnitude, we are the most expansive empire in history. Now, Danny Davis, uh, Danny Surgeon, and, and Matt Howe pushed back. Uh, they tried without success to work within channels. They went public uh, with their reasons for rejecting the American empire. Uh, and I don't want to steal their thunder. And um, um, so we're, we're, we're going to have, uh, we're going to go in order. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Matt Al first. And, and chronologically, he was the one that opened the door. Uh, that then Danny Davis uh, came through second. And then uh, uh, Danny Surgeon. So I don't want to steal their thunder. Uh, we we uh, come and give us your reasons and tell us why you didn't go along and stay silent and why you spoke up. Matt? That is Matt. Hey, Matt. Mute myself. Um, thanks, John, and thanks, Bruce and, and Max for behind the scenes and uh, everyone who's joined us tonight. Um, it's a it's a privilege to be here with you all, and, and, and I'm very humbled uh, to get this award because I know 
some of the other people who got it. And so to be put in the same category is uh, it's a little bit difficult, difficult to accept. Uh, but it's really great to be here with Danny and, and Danny as well. Um, you know, it, it, it wasn't anything that just happened. And, and you know, I, I resigned on my third time to war. Um, it wasn't as if it was, I went once or, you know, it, I, I, I realized the, the, the cruelty of it and the immorality of it and the illegality of it and the uh, stupidity of it uh, prior. Um, I gave it a chance when I realized that it was all those things. I kept going along with it. Um, I mean, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, you know, we were just talking earlier this evening um, about how we lie to ourselves. We get into these situations and uh, we just don't have the strength of character to follow what we know is, is, is intellectually and morally correct or intellectually and morally honest. So we lie to ourselves and it becomes a, a struggle. And that's what it was for me. Uh, you know, when I first go to Iraq, my first time, uh, it's, I get there in April of 04. And my thoughts are that uh, this is obviously a, a mistake. The, the, the reasons about what weapons of mass destruction had long since been disproven. Uh, the insurgency was getting worse and worse. Um, but I feel like I can go and I can do a diff I can make a difference as an individual. Uh, you know, something I learned the hard way that trying to be a moral actor in, in an immoral uh, catastrophe like war, uh, it's just, you know, you, you're, you're screaming into the, the whirlwind. Um, you're not going to make a difference. Um, and at some point, you yourself are going to be overcome and, and be an agent of that immorality, uh, because that's just the, that's that's the, the nature of it. It's uncontrollable. It's on, it, 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 it goes beyond any of our powers. I mean, that's the reality of warfare. And, and, and um, so, you know, I mean, but you do, you lie to yourself. So I, I, I come back and I say, well, you know, I'm going to stay involved because this way uh, when I'm a senior official, I can make a difference. I can do things differently. I can, I can make decisions that would be uh, not as stupid, not as unjust, not as immoral, not as, as illegal as this, um, you know, and then that transitions to when I go back with the Marine Corps, it's, oh, well, I'm a pretty good Marine Corps officer and I can keep these guys alive, my Marines and sailors alive better than some of these other officers I know. So, you know, as the rationales and the lies in my head about myself and my place in this, as they can't stand up to the reality, to the fact, to the, 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 the truth of the wars, um, I try and point it off on others as if I have to do this because of other people. Uh, and then finally, when I get to Afghanistan, my third time to war, uh, I'm so intellectually and morally broken. Uh, the only thing that's holding me together is alcohol. Um, I think that's a big reason for my descent is when I get to alcohol, I can't, when I, sorry, when I get to Afghanistan, I can't drink. Um, and that allows the um, intellectual and moral honesty that I had in my head that I was subjugating with alcohol to break free to a degree and to, to, to you know, have, to have some form of strength and uh, 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 cohesion within my mind to allow me to, to recognize what I'm doing. The other part of it was I get to Afghanistan thinking that the Afghan war was somehow going to be different, that it was going to be the good war. Um, and there was no fundamental difference between the Iraq war and the Afghan war. I mean, that was the last lie I had. The last thing I was holding out for was for that war to be good. It was for that war to be meaningful, for that war to have a purpose. And uh, very quickly after being in Afghanistan, I was, I was uh, removed of, of that opinion and uh, reckon, realized that there was no fundamental difference between the war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq, as long as the U.S. military was occupying Afghanistan, trying to subjugate one part of the population to achieve a military victory for the commander in chief so the commander in chief could be a successful wartime president. Um, there was no uh, difference. Uh, you know, I saw the futility of it, the stupidity of it, the, the illegality of it, the, the immorality of it. Um, the, 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 just the, the, the notion that as we occupied these people, they rebelled against that occupation. As we brought in a corrupt and criminal and klep kleptocratic repressive government of warlords, people rebelled against that. And so it was just not just it was, you know, futile and, and immoral and, and all those things, but it was also incredibly counterproductive. So, um, 
you know, after that point, you know, after being involved in war for my third time, I finally, you know, had the courage based upon some things my father said, um, uh, and uh, I resigned in protest. And uh, now, you know, 12 years later, here I am talking with you all, and in, in, I mean, I'm looking at some of the names who are present here, and, and uh, this is a great group of people to be, uh, again, the privilege I have right now to be speaking to many of you, to all of you, um, is um, something that uh, I'm, I'm, I take very serious and, and, and it's very heartfelt to me that you all joined us this evening to listen to us talk. Um, but, uh, you know, John, I think that's basically my story. I'm not sure if you want, I mean, anyone who knows me knows me, knows I love the sound of my own voice so I can be here as long as you guys want to talk, want to hear you? me. You? So, uh, yeah. I'm going to, I'll one-up that. Great, great, Matt. So, Danny, why don't you jump in? Um, you came through the door right after Matt. Yeah. So, I, I was a, uh, I guess, uh, I have four combat deployments in, in my career. Uh, and this, uh, the one in Afghanistan in 2011 was going to be my final one. And uh, up until that point, I, I was still, you know, kind of like, I'm just going to be, like Matt had said there, I'm one of those that was saying, I know a lot of this stuff seems ridiculous and especially uh, having seen the Iraq war uh, and had served there in 2009 training in Iraqi battalion. I thought this was completely pointless. It was dumb, but I'm going to continue on because maybe I can make a difference. Maybe I can do something that can help people. I want to be part of something that's good. And when I saw in 2009, uh, you know, the explosion of media, uh, that covered Matt's resignation because it was unprecedented at the time. Nobody at that level had resigned in protest of the policy. Uh, and, and I was just mesmerized by what I had heard him say. And then I discovered that actually we lived in the same place, not far from each other. So I was able to track him down and we actually met a few times uh, and, and talked about, you know, his experiences, what he had seen and where I was heading. Uh, and uh, I guess it was also in, in, 2010, I guess, is when we really started uh, meeting a lot of times prior to my deployment in late 2010. <clears throat> and prior to my deployment, I had heard uh, uh, General Petraeus and uh, Michelle Flournoy and then a whole host of others talk about how the war was finally going good, that we had finally turned a corner, that things were getting better, that we were on the right path, that we now had the right inputs. And so now then we're going to start seeing things you know, improve or with McChrystal's uh, government in a box and all that kind of thing. And I had written in 2010 uh, an article in the Armed Forces Journal that called War on the Brink. And I said, if we don't uh, make some drastic changes, we are going to lose the war in Afghanistan. And when I had heard these folks in, in later in 2010 say that things are on the mend, I thought, OK, well, that, I, maybe I'm wrong. I guess I was wrong. I'm, I'm glad to be wrong. Anything that's going to make our troops safe, that's going to stop the killing of the innocent people in Afghanistan, I'm all for that because everybody knows how brutal the Taliban fighters were. And so I'm glad to be a part of that. And I wanted to be there if this was going to truly be the end. I, I, I was happy to get to serve during that time. Uh, of the finishing of it to, so that we could finally end the war and everybody could come home and, and all the killing would stop. But I got, as soon as I got there, my particular job required me to travel all around the country and meeting with uh, leaders everywhere from the commanding general, the division commanding generals of the various regional commands, all the way down to troop leaders, platoon leaders, captains, battalion commanders, and even going on patrol with the foot soldiers, the absolute you know tip of the very spear. So I went on a bunch of uh, combat patrols, foot patrols, ground patrols uh, in areas all over. Actually, everywhere except for RC Southwest where the Marines were. I went everywhere else. And what I saw uh, was just the complete opposite of what was being projected in public. And at first, it just made me angry because I'm like, this is what I was afraid of. And yet all I hear is how things are going good. And I just thought the lie is disgusting, et cetera. But then things started changing and toward the spring uh, of 2011. Now then I'm starting to see men who were killed and I'm starting to see reports. There was one particular one in this in the spring uh, in, in RC East in the Kunar province, not far from the uh, Pakistan border, where uh, there was a big military operation and, and a bunch of Americans were killed. A bunch more were wounded. 
and the Afghan military had performed abysmally. They, they ran from battle. They, they didn't hardly do anything there. And I remember the commanding general at the time uh, going on television, giving interviews to all the media saying, this was a great operation. It was you know, tragic in its outcome that we lost these brave American heroes, but their deaths meant something. Their deaths now are going to improve the situation. They have the Taliban on the run and, and all of this other kind of nonsense. When I then went and read the classified version of what was what actually happened there, I, I mean, my blood was just boiling because there was no truth to any of that. This operation was pointless. There was no strategic rationale. It was just a tactical operation because we could. We went into an area. Sure enough, we killed a bunch of Taliban. They killed a bunch of us, a bunch of the Afghan military. They and then at the end, everyone left. We just departed. We got back in our helicopters, came home. The Afghan military didn't even attempt to stay behind. And the Taliban literally just walked back in. And it was as though we had never been there. So I know that now American men are going to uh, have been killed and a bunch more have severe wounds. Many of them are now are no longer going to get to go home to their wives. Uh, you know, their the kids no longer have a dad. People no longer, parents no longer have sons for nothing. And now I'm starting to get really angry. And, and it, this was when it first started occurring to me that Matt did because, you know, his resignation meant something. And I, and I, and I at least started first pondering this. Now we go into the summer and uh, one of the other in the, uh, I believe it was, uh, oh, it was in the Kandahar province. Uh, again, I went on a patrol and I went with, with a, a bunch of the men who were, at the forwardmost patrol in that area, they were pushing the Taliban further and further back, trying to reclaim the area. And uh, in the process of that, I, I got to know some of the men in a particular unit down in there in the uh, Argandab Valley is where the operation took place. And, uh, and these two particular soldiers, the uh, patrol sergeant uh, made a point of pointing out to me and telling me that, you know, these were such great guys. Uh, they had a, a, a difficult past that they had really overcome, risen above it, and were now two of the best troops he'd had and just had a bright future and all that. And, and I remember just watching them go about their job in this as building the patrol base that we were establishing. And you can just tell that they're good guys, you know, that they're, they were teammates, they're hard workers. And when you hear the story behind it, you, you, I just beamed with pride just at wearing the same uniform as, as men like that. And then about six weeks later, I'm at my headquarters in Bagram Air Base, and I go to the, to the chow hall, and the Stars and Stripes newspaper was always there uh, for the day's news. And I see this big headline on the front, they're all dead. And, and uh, there was a picture of a wreckage of an MRAP, just twisted metal. And so I pick it up and I start reading it, and I realize that that's the unit that I was with just a few weeks earlier. And then when I read the names of the fallen, I saw that those two kids were among them. And so now it's personal. Now it's somebody I know that was killed. And somebody who had a great future, somebody who was a good guy. And now they're killed for no reason, for no purpose at all. And, and all around me, I see the evidence that everything General Petraeus is saying is a lie. Everything that the, the various other commanders are saying is a lie. There's nothing improving. There's nothing getting better. The Afghan military was not getting better. The Afghan government was not getting less uh, uh, corrupt. All of those things were lies. And I could see it on blatant display. Anyone who was on the ground could see it. And as, as it got closer to the time for me to redeploy uh, in, in October of 2011, uh, I just could not keep my mouth closed. I, I, it was such a moral imperative, a drive that I couldn't be quiet. I, I felt that these men who died, who, who, who were dead and know the truth, they can't speak anymore. Who's going to speak for them? Or the ones that haven't died yet. That was what really drove me. That there's other men who are alive right now who are, who are doomed to die if we don't stop this madness. And for the possibility of that, I said, I, I just can't remain silent. I have to do something. So as soon as I got back, I actually got with Matt, told him what I was thinking, and, and, and he gave me some hard advice. He says, he says you know, that you, it's probably going to cost you your career. Probably nothing's going to happen. You're going to get in a lot of trouble, and the war is just going to continue to grind on. He, of course, he said, of course, I support you. That's the same reason I did the same thing, but you need to know what you're up against, what you're facing if you do this. And uh, I had a number of other people that were helping me, and 
And I, I said, I, I don't want to have my career ended. I don't want to go through all this difficulty, but I'm not able to not do it. It was just a compulsion that I could not keep silent. It was just morally impossible for me. I, I actually don't give myself credit because I couldn't do anything else. And so Matt and a number of other people helped me prepare. Uh, they helped me put some things together. They actually did a tremendous job in giving me back up uh, by uh, making connections with a number of members of the House and the Senate both. So before I went public, uh, I actually had some private backing among members of Congress who, uh, and especially uh, uh, Barbara Lee and, and uh, uh, Walter Jones were the two stalwarts that were really behind me. And I, you know, I miss Walter Jones to this day. And and I still have a great respect and admiration for Barbara Lee because she took the courage to stand. She was the first one, uh, you know, right after 9-11 who foresaw what would happen if we didn't get this thing under control. Uh, she was the only one that voted against it, had death threats and all that kind of stuff. So I was grateful for their support. Uh, I did come forward uh, there in February 2012 was when everything broke. And as Matt predicted and as common sense told me, it didn't make any difference. The generals just said, Oh yeah, we read his stuff, but that's just one person's opinion. We're still very confident in our viewpoint, etc. Um, and I didn't lose my career. I didn't get kicked out. I got sent off basically in a corner of Washington D.C. to uh, serve the rest of my career, kind of in anonymity, uh, which at that time I was only too happy to do. And uh, and then here we are today. And as Matt and now as Danny's about to explain, you know, all the things that we saw, all the things that we projected, which were so easy. It didn't take any kind of tough analysis to be able to figure out, have all been proven. And now all the lies that were told year after year after year by commander after commander after commander that things were getting better is now on display for all to see was a lie. It was always a lie. And now then we have the wreckage of thousands of bodies and tens of thousands of Afghans uh, died for no reason that they, they could have gotten on earlier. The ironic part of the way this thing has ended is that right now, all of our 20 years we were there allegedly trying to help the people and protect them. Now then the war is over because we lost and the killing has stopped. Now, we may not like the government that comes out. They may not like it. But right now, there's no more killings. There's no more IEDs. All that stuff has stopped for the people of Afghanistan. And that's a sobering reality. And with that, I'll pass it off to Danny Scherzen. Thanks, Danny. Danny. Spurgeon. Well, I'm really honored to be here. And at the same time, there's almost, I don't want to say an embarrassment, but there's a sense of awe about the fact that Matt Ho and, and, and Danny, they, they were so far ahead of me on all of this. And we were talking before the call started when they were beginning their descent and blowing whistles and saying things that have all been vindicated, none of which, by the way, probably affects them in any real sense. I mean, I don't think there's any pride in the vindication of being right about the Afghan war. It's such a tragedy that I don't think we can do that. But when they were doing that, I was deploying to Afghanistan as a, you know, captain in the cavalry getting ready to take over a district. I mean, I knew it was all wrong. And so in a certain sense, you know, being the anchor bowler in the, in the speech here is, is odd. And I know we went sequential and there's something to that. Um, there's nothing heroic about my descent. Uh, I began writing anti-war sort of tracks in 2017. I was very much in the situation where I almost wanted to get caught. I mean, I was pushing the limits for a lot of the same reasons that we've heard earlier today. But the thing that irks me is that I stayed too long. I mean, I stayed too long on active duty. Um, Matt and Danny did something that at the time in 2009, 10, 11 was unthinkable to me. And, and there's a lot of reasons. Now, by the way, by the time I get to Afghanistan in 2011, I'm, I'm anti-war. I mean, I'm on, the left, I guess you could say, or, or whatever, how we want to define it. I mean, I'm out there on the margins, but I'm in uniform. And it was the Iraq war. And I think it's interesting that both Matt and I were in Iraq first. Uh, Danny, were you in Iraq first? Or I was in Afghanistan first. 
Afghanistan first. So a lot of us um, who were, you know, sort of in a, a younger generation would graduate from the academy or ROTC. Matt had been in before 9-11 and I just barely had been. But by the time I graduated, most of us went to Iraq first. And it really was in Iraq that sort of my descent unfolded, you know, because what I'm observing is a country, as Matt mentioned, that had nothing to do with 9-11, um, that we tore apart with this invasion. And that because of that, I'm, on, I'm, I'm witnessing a sectarian civil war unfold on a level that I really couldn't imagine. And so my descent was a quiet descent. It was a cowardly descent. It was growing my hair a little longer than the other officers. It was talking smack uh, on the side and showing everyone how much smarter I was than them. I think Matt Ho may know something about that. But what, what did it really amount to? So, I mean, I knew the Iraq war was wrong. I saw the gap between the lies and the realities. I, I was against it. Now I go to Afghanistan and it's 2011. So it's three years later. I'm a captain. I'm in charge of this whole district or this sub district. And I'm a mercenary. And that was the truth. On the 10th anniversary of 9-11, Reuters sent a reporter to my little outpost that I commanded. I commanded two small outposts, uh, my main one. I mean, this is pretty far southwest in Kandahar province, so we're almost on the Helmand border. It's like the Yankees going to Fenway Park. I mean, this is the Taliban's home turf. And they said, you know, build democracy, all this, like all the, the stuff that Matt <laughs> resigned over and, and Danny got himself put into the, you know, the, the deep rest recesses of the army establishment, you know, when he probably would have been a brigade commander otherwise. Um, I saw the same things, but, you know, I'm, I'm taking over the district. And the reasons I stayed at the time, they, they stick with me. And so it's hard, right? I'm so honored to be in this group. And, and Danny and Matt are not only my professional, my personal friends, but eight or nine years after they were doing the right thing, I'm still I'm a mercenary. Why, why did I stay? Why did it take so long to descend? I think this is important because it helps understand why we're giving an award to three guys who we're awarding because they stand out, right? I mean, we do, we stand out, we're weird. Most of us don't do this. Officers, <laughs> state foreign officials do not descend. They do not risk that life. It is a wonderful thing, Danny and Matt, not if it's correct. It is a wonderful thing in the short term to be adulated by everyone in your life system. You are an American soldier. You are a scholar. You're a State Department. You, you did Iraq. You did Afghanistan. Everybody tells you you're wonderful. The easiest thing in the world is to stick with it. And I stuck with it way longer than the two gentlemen who preceded me. And I live with that. But... I think it's important to understand why people do, why people wait as long as me to descend, and why people most don't, most people don't descend. Number one, we all like gold stars. I've loved them since kindergarten. I was never late. A lot of gold stars on the wall. So when captains told me as a lieutenant that I had to stay because the good guys have to stay, boy, did I like it. I did. I did. 23, 25, 28, 38. Honestly, you give me some positive reinforcement, I'll probably still like it. And then I would start to say, well, I'm on my second marriage. Healthcare is phenomenal. The benefits are decent. What am I really qualified for besides calling Apache, mis you know, Apache airstrikes? 90 grand a year to do that. And if I stay in, you know, I can go teach at West Point. And then there's the other element where you start to moralize it. And I've heard, I heard Matt talk about this. I heard Tanny talk about this. I've heard you both talk about this a number of times. You start to tell yourself, if I stay in, it's better because if one of these sociopaths is in charge, if one of the other guys who doesn't know the war is wrong, who doesn't realize it's so wrong that I'll lie, I did, it should 
which should have been kicked out for that. Didn't get caught. Dissemble to try to keep my people alive. I'll give the colonel the impression that we did what we did, but we didn't really do it. You start to tell yourself, and that's when you get self-righteous, which of course is the original sin of the soldier. So you, you get self-righteous and say, I have to stay because if I will protect my boys over the mission. So anyway, that's the checklist of reasons I stayed in and that I was complicit in a major war crime. What I saw unfold, though, was nothing compared to what I've seen unfold since. And I think that has really changed the way that I frame dissent to the extent that I even do it, right? What is this? What is this conversation that I'm having? What is, what is the reason I'm doing this? It's, it's, it's penance, right? It's lapsed Catholic guilt. But I hope it's more than that. It probably isn't. Um, in Afghanistan, three of the soldiers in my troop were, were killed. Uh, two of them bled to death on the airfield. Um, 32 were wounded, troop of 82. I mean, those were higher casualties than most, but we were, you know, we were in Fenway Park, right? We were in Taliban's Fenway. No big deal, right? Of course, those guys, Gustavo Rios, Nick Hensley, Chaz Ray Clark, three who died. We also dropped six limbs in the living. No big deal, right? So it goes, as Bonnie would say. They did it for thirty to forty thousand dollars a year. What did we find out this last week? Nation building doesn't work, right? Doesn't work in Afghanistan. It does work one place. Suburbs of Washington, D.C., where nation building went perfectly well because the war industry executives and middle managers who are literally nation building an extension on their second home, they work there. And, and, and I've thought since that it would be obscene not to speak about that. In fact, the really self-righteous side of me, the side of me that I don't like, Suddenly I hide from my girlfriend and it makes me sad, thinks this. Why don't my buddies speak up? I'm going to, I'm going to a wedding with the lieutenants that I served with, my best friends in two days. They know and I love them, but it is extraordinarily hard to do it. I was a coward for like a decade and a half when Danny and Matt were doing what was what, what was right. So it's not so much judgment as wondering why, wondering how a system develops where an extraordinarily large percentage of the ground combat officers know that they're dropping guys, that they're burying kids, that they're giving speeches for kids they barely knew and go on with it and don't say, you know, these wars are hopeless. God, there's something in the system. Something's going on. Anyway. Sticking with the self-righteous angle, I think that one of the things that I'm most proud of is that I know Matthew Ho. And I know Danny Davis. And I know them not just virtually, which post-COVID is how we all know each other. And that's been a privilege for me. And I'm really uh, genuinely uh, honored to be part of this. And speaking of controversial people, as if Matt Owen and Danny Davis aren't enough, I'm sure the death threats and the, uh, you know, sort of attacks on their character uh, have been implicated that. But, uh, but I also know Oliver Stone a little, and uh, that was a name drop. But I think when I think back to the end of the scene platoon, when the helicopter is pulling out and Chris Taylor is on it and he says, you know, about his time in Vietnam, he says, those of us who did make it have an obligation to teach to others what we know and to try with what's left of our lives to find a goodness and a meaning in this life. I'm still working on it. Matt's still working on it. And I sure know Danny's still working on it. I'm so glad to know these people and it's such an honor to even be here. And I just hope that 
organizations like this continue to spread the truth. And thanks so much for including me. Thank you, Danny. Matt, can you uh, uh, show them show the uh, Defender of Liberty words? Can you put them up on the screen? Okay, this is Matt, you, and uh, the glare is there, but the, uh, it has the Aristotle quote that courage is the first virtue, making all the other virtues possible. Danny, there's your Defender of Liberty Award. And Danny Swerger. And we'll have these in the mail too. And we're sorry we couldn't do it in person, but uh, uh, we didn't. We thought the time was opportune, particularly with the hearings. Now, um, how many of you had an opportunity to listen to the hearings? Um, I think uh, who was it told me they only could take two hours of the congressional hearings this week? Yeah, that was me. And what what did you you had to stop after two hours? Yeah, I couldn't stomach any more because, uh, they, you know, I, all I saw was nothing but a bunch of self-righteous generals up there trying to cast blame onto any and everybody else, uh, you know, talk about whether the President Trump knew this or whether President Biden was said this, whatever, but almost no exception, uh, acknowledgement of their own specific personal culpability. It was always somebody else's fault. And I, and I was uh, not surprised, but disappointed by that. Matt, Danny, you want to comment? Yeah, I mean, I, I think when you asked me that question, I, I, I you know, I, I couldn't even make two hours of it either. Um, and for the same reasons Danny said. And, you know, one of the things, the weight of this is not supposed to be on junior and mid-level officers. You know, the weight of this is supposed to be on the people that are, providing that testimony, you know, the General Millies, the General McMasters, the General Petraeus's, you know, uh, Bruce and John and I spoke about those three quite for quite a while this morning, but the weight is supposed to be on them. The weight is supposed to be on the members of Congress. The weight is supposed to be on the people in the Biden White House, the Trump White House and the Obama White House. I mean, the Bush White House, you know, the, the, the weight is not supposed to be on the, 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 the need to resign, the need to speak out, the need to dissent should not have to come from, you know, men and women in their 20s and 30s. This is what we have people in senior positions for. This is what the, you know, the, the kids, the, 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 the reasons why Danny and Danny and I did all this is because of the, the kids we knew who got sacrificed for nothing. Right. Who, who the stuff we've seen and the stuff that we've had on us, the, you know, and, and what's even worse than the blood and the bone and the skin and everything else that I've had on my hands is the tears from the moms and the girlfriends and the wives and the daughters at the funerals. And, you know, you go to these funerals and it's not the men. The men don't cry. It's the men just stand there like they've gotten hit in the head with a shovel, you know, and it's those blank looks from the men and the tears from the women. Um you know, that, that's the reason why we do these, why we dissent. It's just not, it's just not worth it. And, and what we saw happen to the Afghans and the Iraqis, but that weight shouldn't be on us. It needs to be on the men like General Milley. Uh, you know, it should be on uh, the men and women who populate the House Armed Services Committee and the Senate Armed Services Committee. And unfortunately, that, that's not what we see. Yeah. John, I just want to state, you know, my admiration for the three winners. They've been exceptionally humble and uh, been very self-deprecatory, de but I think that's unwarranted. Uh, you have shown exceptional courage, and I certainly want those sentiments uh, uh, to be displayed. Um, I want to ask um, whether any of you had uh, remembered uh, John Kerry uh, before he was a senator and then uh, Secretary of State uh, coming to testify before J. William Fulbright's Foreign Relations Committee and saying who's going to tell the last soldier in Vietnam he died for a political mistake and then threw his medal over the fence uh, and thought that that was a standard that was unavailable to you because Congress was somnolent uh, in stupefaction and it was really other than the individuals like uh, Walter Jones and Barbara Lee that simply wasn't a forum where you could share your concerns. 
Well, I mean, I as someone who's kind of like studied this issue with John Kerry, I mean, I find it really interesting. For example, the About Face organization, Veterans Against the War, which used to be called Iraq Veterans Against the War. I'm a member and, you know, I know a lot of the people there and I came in late, but some of the people who were in the early founding of the organization, they actually, you know, went to John Kerry in 2004 and said, look at your background, look who you were, right? You were a Vietnam veteran against the war. You were the voice against the immorality of this. And look at this war and won't you stand with us? And he ignored them. I think that the John Kerry who goes before Congress when he is a Lieutenant JG or whatever he is shows uh, an extraordinary amount of courage. I, I like that John Kerry, the John Kerry who becomes a presidential candidate who knows that in the Imperial presidency, right? Getting back to the point of this committee in a lot of ways, knows that in the era of the Imperial presidency to be an anti-war presidential candidate in 2004 is a losing option. Of course he loses anyway. But I think it does speak to something that's very different about these two wars. And Matt and Danny, I, I, I know you guys have interesting thoughts on this that could build on this, but something profound is different from the time when John Kerry does the Winter Soldier hearings to when we start descending. If we're rare, it's not because we're special and interesting and wildly courageous in an ethical sense, we're rare because there's no draft. I mean, this is a Praetorian guard of soldiers and, and even civilian government officials. And so the notion is that you don't, there's no reason to complain. I mean, how many times, Danny and Matt, have you heard, well, why are you dissenting? You volunteer. hundred times, yeah. And, and, and I think there's something profoundly problematic about that. And it doesn't necessarily mean the draft needs to come back. It doesn't necessarily mean we need a million man army. I think those things are, are separate issues, but I do think that it speaks to something that's going on in the way that our discourse about militarism works. Isn't it a strange country indeed where the citizenry today is largely against the forever wars? I mean, to the extent that they even pay attention to them. Finally, the polls seem to demonstrate that most folks are, while it's not their top issue, are against the idea of us being deployed overseas. But that same country fetishizes military service. I don't say agile. I don't say thank you for my service. I say fetishizes it. It's gone that far. I mean, I'm just old enough. Matt's a little older. Danny is a lot older uh -huh. to remember a time when there were basically two days three maybe july 4th memorial day in may and then veterans day when tbs would play all the war movies and there might be soldiers on the 50 yard line right or the jumbo shop i remember that i'm just old enough just barely old enough to remember that now it's fetishization of a military that most people don't even think about joining. There's like a profound insecurity behind it. And I think that if, if we don't think that that's what's partly driving the length and, and, and just the uh, persistence of these wars, then maybe we're missing something here. And uh, anyway, I don't know what, what the Danny and Matt, but I, I think we're, this is an important question, Bruce, and I appreciate it because I think it raises a bunch of different things. Yeah, and, and the couple things uh, that I want to point out is that I, I virtually agree with every word that Danny just said. Uh, but, you know, I, I was thinking about, first of all, just on the John Kerry aspect himself, because I'm wondering why, why did he not do something when he had power to do something? So, as he's sitting there on those hearings and wearing the uniform and throwing his medal and all that, this, uh, you know, it was a symbol, but he had no power to do anything. Now that he has power to do something, both as a senator and then later as a cabinet secretary, he could have done something. And instead, he did nothing. He remained completely silent. 
And that was really discouraging to me that somebody that once had the same stance that, that the three of us have, when he actually had the power to do something about it, punted and, and shamelessly so. He didn't seem to be embarrassed about it because I know it came up, it would come up time to time for years. But the second thing about it, which was always haunting to me, uh, you know, that phrase, you know, who wants to be the last one to die for a pointless war has, has been a continual motivator for me to write and, and go on TV about this year after year, uh, saying how there shouldn't be another American die for a pointless war. And when Trump made the deal in February 2020 and the Taliban actually took, uh, did that part of it where they didn't target any more Americans, uh, you know, the, I just, we can debate a lot about how the withdrawal was conducted and, uh, you know, if it could have been done better, of course, it could have been done a lot better. Uh, but I was still just hoping against hope that that uh, that we would get out without any more loss of life. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. And it was just so anguishing to me because I immediately thought, like Danny talked about a minute ago, I thought about the, all those family members of those 13 Americans that were killed right there at the end, like 48 hours before the end of the war, 48 hours, you're almost out. And now then here's another whole batch of, of uh, lifetime scars that are going to be inflicted upon all those left. And then yeah, I, I don't think we could, should fail to mention those uh, 10 civilians, innocent civilians that were also killed on that stupid bomb, that drone strike that never needed to happen. And no, despite what anybody in public has said, that absolutely was not necessary. It was an entirely avoidable mistake. And somebody should be held to account for that because 10 innocent people, seven kids are dead for no reason. And it was avoidable. But unfortunately, we just want to sweep that under the rug, too. And when this so-called three-star investigation comes back from Secretary Austin, I'm sure it's going to say, oh, it was just the fog of war and all this other crap. It was it's just not going to be true. But that's almost certainly the way it's going to come out. Uh, you know, McKinsey claimed that I, I'm responsible for this and I take responsibility and authority, but he did nothing. He didn't put his stars on the table. He didn't say, you know, it's my fault. I had the ultimate authority. And so I resigned. Nothing. He just said words. I took responsibility, but took no action. So it, it means nothing. And so that's part of the discouragement that this is just going to continue on. Uh, and there's going to be no change because now these hearings are over. Uh, people are going to just, uh, you know, dust it off and move on to the next thing and nothing will change. All these generals will still be in their positions. All the system that produced them is going to go on unchanged until we have another disaster. And that's, that's what haunts me. Uh, Chaz, uh, you want to weigh in here? Uh, you've been speaking out a lot on the Afghan war. Well, I, I would like to say that I greatly admire these three men, um, not least because as professional soldiers in a professional army, uh, they show what is best about our country. Uh, they had a conscience. They were troubled. They risked their careers. They spoke out. Uh, that is not easy. And um, uh, I admire them. Um, having said that, I think there's an underlying theme here. And that is the unwillingness of our country, or perhaps its inability as a result of the collapse of our constitutional checks and balances to engage in the necessary reviews and introspection about why all this happened. Why dishonesty in vertical communication became the norm. Why mistaken policy was perpetuated uh, without being checked, why the Congress chose to remain silent and complicit in policies that everyone who looked at them honestly knew were failing. Do we not have the capacity anymore to know ourselves? We clearly don't know our enemies. And I guess I would say, in the case of Afghanistan, there is an Afghan narrative as well as an American one. And the Afghan narrative says that for 2,500 years, not a single invader 
with the exception of Genghis Khan, who was in, who engaged in genocide, not a single invader has been able to subdue the Afghans or change them. If I were an Afghan, I'd be proud of that. I wish I could be prouder of my own country's intervention in that country. I wish it had not done the huge damage it did, not just at the national level, but as we heard this evening, at the individual level, at the family level. And uh, so, uh, John, this uh, event makes me wish I was still uh, the chairman of the Committee for the Republic. Uh, I'm glad you did it, and I will end there. Well, thank you, Chas. Um, next, uh, <clears throat> we're looking at, uh, I think, was it October 20th? Um, we're going to take advantage of um, uh, Chaz and, and uh, give Chaz the Defender of Liberty Award next month. And we'll have a chance to continue this conversation with Chaz on uh, a lot of different um, <clears throat> parallels. Chaz's uh, talk last December on uh, potential war with China over Taiwan uh, had the greatest number of hits. I think uh, um, it was really extraordinarily well, got a lot of attention and uh, so we'll be covering a number of subjects in addition to Afghanistan and Iraq next uh, on October 20th. So mark your calendar. So uh, Ray McGovern, I haven't, um, what have you been up to? Uh, we want to weigh in here. You, uh, you've been quite active. Uh, you've always been active. I don't think I've ever known you when you weren't active. You, you're you're uh, muted, uh, Ray. I know you're used to being muted, but uh, let's <laughs> unmute you. <laughs> well, I uh, I just have to say how much I admire you three, um, and how how much honored I feel in knowing knowing you, Matt, most of all, but you two also by your writings and by your speaking out. You know, I'd like to go back to the. Um, the award, the plaque, and I was delighted to hear what's on it. It has to do with courage, right? Right. And it says, uh, may a little put here, that courage is what makes all other virtue possible. Well, that goes back to Thomas Aquinas, for God's sake. You know, what he said was that courage is the basis for all virtue. Um, if you... Uh, all other virtue is specious if you don't have guts, okay? Now, <laughs> one other word about Thomas. He talked about the virtue of anger. Whoa. I needed to remember that. I studied a lot of Thomas in college, but when I saw my friends in the intelligence community deliberately falsifying intelligence to justify, in quotes, the war in Iraq, I got angry as hell. And, and you know, <laughs> it, oh, back in the Bronx, they'll give you, if you are Irish, about two weeks to calm down. Uh, I couldn't calm down after four weeks. And so then I remembered, whoops, the virtue of anger. What did Thomas say about that? He said, he or she who is not angry when there is just cause for anger sins and is wrong, okay? And he talked about unreasoned patience. And what he said was, unreasoned patience sows the seeds of vice, nourishes negligence, and encourages even good people to do evil. And I, I call that to mind here for lots of reasons. Uh, some, of, uh, some of the remarks uh, lead right into that. But I'd like to focus just for a second on anger. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, I guess, I don't know if Danny and Danny and Matt are Irish at all, but, but I could understand them being angry, and I would, <laughs> I, would just, virgin, so. <laughs> I would just like them to realize that they are virtuous, all right? There is a virtue of anger, and that is why they spoke out. Now, the last thing I'll say is that I got angry this week real bad, and especially at General McKenzie. Did I read this morning that the Taliban offered to put a perimeter of security around the airport? 
and not interfere with our withdrawal. And McKinsey said, oh, I don't have any instructions to accept that. They asked them, did he tell the president? No, no, I didn't tell him, but Khalid Zad was there. Maybe he told, well, give me a break. In my view, McKinsey and to a lesser extent the other were insubordinate. They wanted to show up the president for what they saw as a fool. And they fully expected that he'd have to send the Marines and the army back in there, okay? So, you know, in terms of anger, uh, I'm very virtuous tonight, and I would just implore us to figure out some way to get these three courageous people before the American people so they can see what's really going on, so they can see people who are on the ground holding the guts of the, of the soldiers that worked for them and can speak with the kind of credibility and authority that is needed at this time. Sorry to speak so long, but you know, I'm in awe of these free men. Well, thank John, you, Ray. The um, three I have to ask is, do they think that um, if there was uh, media coverage of the wars uh, like there was in Vietnam, that you would have felt uh, easier uh, to communicate your disgruntlement and expose the lies? You know, it seemed to me the military after Vietnam said no more movie cameras and they co-opted the, the media coverage. Do you think it would have made a difference if you had a, me I mean, a Vietnam type media coverage of Afghanistan and Iraq with regard to people like you wanting to find a, a platform to speak? Well, unfortunately, uh, I think that was actually part of the problem that there was a great deal of media, uh, especially after the uh, around uh, I want to say 2004, 2005 of the Iraq wars, it seemed to really explode as the embed situation. Uh, and that was bastardized into not just providing accurate or independent media access, but very carefully tailored media access. So they were basically not, not directly. No one, no one to that I know of directly said, Hey, cover this. Don't cover that. Say this. Don't say that but it was strongly implied. So they were taken only to places that were, had a good news story. They were given, you know, access to the generals and, you know, and fed it and all this and this stuff and treated important. Uh, and when people did start to report about things that were not pleasant, then they had their access cut off. All the other reporters saw that. So they got the message. If you want to have the great access to the commanding general, uh, if you want to be able to be invited to go on these soirees, you know, and, and that helps your own career, then they'll do that. And, and so, un regrettably, that did not make it, uh, you know, a, an opportune moment. You, you had like Mike Hastings was one of the very few uh, blockbuster exceptions to that. And unfortunately, we lost him uh, not long after a lot of his stuff came out, but uh, there weren't many like him. Right. I see uh, uh, former Salon Speaker John Mueller. Uh, John, are you out in Ohio or are you here at Cato? Oh. Yeah, I, I'm at, out here in Ohio. Um, Good. I'd, I'd like to ask a question um, about the Afghan troops. Insofar as there was a military strategy, uh, the idea was to basically control the violence and then turn the whole thing over to the Afghan security forces and police. Uh, as we all know, they, when push came to shove, they collapsed in about five minutes. And I assume that was not a surprise to any of the three of you. But would you talk more about the relationship between the Americans and the people they were training to take over the war? Uh, I'll jump in real quick. Um, I think that Danny probably has the best answer for this, given sort of the role that he played. Um, and then Matt probably has a different response based on like the high level look at this but I thought I would jump in and just talk about when I was a captain in charge of the sub district in you know Pashmul Kandahar well Zari district Kandahar Afghanistan I actually touched pretty much every Afghan security force so we had the uh, Afghan police the the local police they were I mean they were drug addicted holders of territory right they they were supposed to be police but they didn't like do forensics they didn't solve crimes they kind of held ground against the taliban and i know danny knows a lot about this because he toured all these sites i had the afghan army with me on my base um and then i raised uh actually the first conventional unit in Kandahar province to raise 
Afghan local police, which is to say, basically militia led by a local warlord um, with a special forces team to pretend that it was legit. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I had done that. I guess my, my take on it was this, and, and I'll keep that brief. These were not cowardly people. This idea that like the Afghan army collapsed because they don't have any fight in them is, is absurd. I mean, some of them were incredibly effective fighters. The truth is though, from what I can tell, on the ground, the Afghan military, especially the army, never had very much more legitimacy than we did. Never had very much more legitimacy than we did. Why would I say that? Well, down in Helmand and Kandahar, where they speak Pashto and the Taliban is at home plate at Fenway Park, bringing in a bunch of Tajiks and Uzbeks from Wisconsin to come down to Texas, West Texas too, because I was out in the sticks, right? Bringing them in might not really pan out. And what was one of the most interesting experiences in my time in Afghanistan, and I will tell you, was one of the most instructive things in my entire life about what it is to run a bureaucracy. And Raymond McGovern is speaking, hero of mine, and I've listened to him talk a thousand times about how the concept that Americans have of the, the competence of their intelligence or their military agencies might need to get relooked. The assistant division commander of the 82nd Airborne Division in charge of all of RC South, which is to say regional command South, which is to say all of Southern Afghanistan where the surge was supposed to work came down to my site when I was raising this militia and I said, sir, after he praised me for a while, because obviously I was winning the war there, he said, what is one of your biggest challenges? And I said this, the Afghan army that's on my base, the locals think they're about as foreign as we are. General one star type said, why? I said, well, from hundreds of miles away, and they don't necessarily speak Pashto. Some of them do, most of them don't. In fact, they need an interpreter as much as I do. General in charge of the Southern, second in command, sorry, of the Southern part of Afghanistan said to me, what? And it became clear to me that a one-star general in the 82nd Airborne didn't understand that the Afghan army didn't necessarily speak Pashto in the areas where the Taliban thrived. And I thought, just after the 10th anniversary of 9-11, something is awry. But the point I think I'm getting at is not that the Afghan army or the soldiers in it weren't courageous, but that they saw the writing on the wall. And just like the people that I would meet in the villages who would tell me that they preferred the Taliban courts to the Kabul corruption courts, what they valued maybe was order over liberty, stability. It doesn't mean that we have to like the stability, but most Americans have the privilege of not having to make those kind of decisions. And so I think it's important to understand that like the Afghan army wasn't cowardly. It was, it was foreign and that maybe they were always tainted by the notion that they were lackeys of the Americans. One of the reasons that they got tainted with the notion that they were lacking the Americans is the Americans were militarily occupying them for 20 years. So maybe the problem was the occupation. Maybe the problem was militarism. And that may have in the end doomed the Afghan government because what happened is the Taliban is the only legitimate resistance. And so they become the resistance and their sins are forgiven, which anybody who's watched Red Dawn or my soldiers who would tell me that, God, I wish the Soviets would invade Texas. And I'd say the Soviet Union has been gone for quite some time. And they'd say, who cares? I just want to fight an invader. Maybe there's something to that. So I know that's a long answer. But so can else. one of you uh, uh, take us through how the cash worked? Uh, you know, we, we focus a lot on how the cash works on this end with Congress and the military contractors buying the Congress, but how does the cash work out in the field? Um, how much money would you 
did, did, did your different levels? Did you uh, hand out every, did you hand out money every week or every? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it really was cash. It was just as you've seen and heard the story, you know, seen the, excuse me, seen the photos, heard the stories about the pallets of cash. That was actually it. It was, you know, right from the federal reserve shrimp racked hundred dollar bills, serialized. You'd open up a, a, a pack of it and it, you know, the numbers were sequential. Um, I dealt more with the money in Iraq than in Afghanistan, but it was the same thing. And it was a, you know, the, the Department of Defense has a, they call it money as a weapon system. And the idea is that you're going to use money to try and achieve some type of objective, just as you would violence. And um, you know, you're trying to get effects, non-kinetic effects in the, the language of the Department of Defense and the Department of State. And um, I would, when I handled the money in uh, Iraq, I had, uh, the most I ever had at one point on my on myself in the safes in my bedroom was twenty four million dollars in cash, and Jeez. yeah, and I would I would pay out anywhere from three hundred to about three million dollars a week. Every and I know Danny Danny uh, Surgeson has said this, and, and Danny Davis has seen the same thing. You know, I would pay that amount out every week, and at the same place, same time, and no one was ever robbed. Right. My, my Iraqi contractors would show up with their they would literally take six hundred thousand dollars off of our fob in a plastic bag and you'd never hear about anyone getting robbed. I mean, so it was um, the, 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 the corruption of it all from the top to the bottom. The, 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 but most especially most especially like the intellectual corruption of it that somehow this was going to make things better. Somehow we were going to buy off loyalty to get to the point Dan just made about his soldiers talking about, I wish somebody would invade West Texas. I mean, it's the same kind of thing. If somebody invaded West Texas and handed out hundred dollar bills, you think that's going to stop them from fighting them? I mean, that was a type of intellectual uh, corruption that was going on that somehow we could purchase these people's loyalty. And remember, of course, with Iraq, we have been bombing them the entire decade previously, you know, all through the 90s and then the Clinton administration, Bill Clinton dropped a bomb on Iraq once every three days during his presidency. You know, and prior to that was the, the nearly 10 year long war, Iraq, uh, Iran, Iraq war, which was a proxy war for the US. I mean, so the Iraqis had already gone through two decades of warfare before we showed up where the United States was, in their view, rightfully, rightful view, persecuting them and delivering nothing but suffering to them. And we expect that throwing around $100 bills is somehow going to get them to like us and agree with the occupation. And the same thing in Afghanistan, the same, same, same fundamental aspect, you know, th th this idea that somehow we're going to buy off the allegiance, that we are going to, um, our money is going to paste over uh, the brutal reality of occupation. Um, so yeah, I mean, the money was, um, you know, and the people we had in power, uh, I worked all with, uh, when I was in Iraq, my first time in Saladin province and as well in Kirkuk and, um, uh, also to a bit in Diyala province, um, but especially in Saladin province, which is where Tikrit is, uh, hometown of, of Saddam Hussein. Um, I worked primarily with former Ba'ath party people, you know, um, and then when we in Iraq, I'm sorry, in Afghanistan, the people we worked with, um, the people in charge uh, of the Afghan government were warlords, warlords, drug lords. They were uh, profiteers. They were opportunists. We would call them collaborationists, right? I mean, they'd be, they'd be collaborators. You know, these are the these are the people that uh, after uh, you know the war is over, they're strung up uh, because they collaborated with the occupying enemy. Um, I mean, these were the people we worked with. And so these were people who were looking to profit, looking to take opportunity, um, who were, again, they were warlords. And we, we expected somehow because they were alongside us that the leopard was going to change his spots. Um, and that was, you know, not the case. So the money just made things worse. It, it just exasperated. The, 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 it made the wrong people, the worst people more powerful. And a lot of that money went to the insurgencies in both Iraq and in Afghanistan. I used to wonder about, in um, Afghanistan, you go out to a place like where Danny was, you know, you'd see this small battle position or 
combat outpost or whatever we were calling those things at the time. And you wonder, well, how, how come, you know, you'd ask the, 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 the lieutenant who is in charge, you know, what do you control? And the lieutenant would say, I can control what I can hit with my machine guns. The Taliban control everything else. And so you'd say, okay, you've got about 30 guys here. You've got about 30 or so Afghan security forces. You're completely surrounded by Taliban. How come you don't get overrun? And I came away with two reasons for this. And I found this both in the East and in the South. And it'd be interesting to hear both Danny's thoughts on this. But, you know, one reason is because the Taliban didn't want to mass because of our air power. They knew that if they got together in large numbers, our aircraft or our attack helicopters or, or drones or whatever would be able to hit them. Uh, the, the more salient reason, though, was because these things were a gold mine, right? You had this American lieutenant, American captain in the middle of nowhere, Afghanistan, a, a place that had been wrecked by 30 or 40 years of war. There was no industry at all. There was no money at all. There was no economy. And this American lieutenant or captain had been given anywhere from a half million to $2 million a year to spend in cash on building schools, building wells, you know, resurfacing roads. And, you know, who do you think did that work? If it wasn't the Taliban build, dig, digging that well, it was the cousin of the Taliban. All right. So these things were basically an ATM machine. So the, the more you kind of peel the layers away of these wars, the more you understand that the most important books to read about these wars, to understand them, are probably, uh, you know, Catch-22 by Heller or Mash by uh, Hooker. Because it's just so absurd. Well, it's funny building on Matt. Uh, so many of the things that he mentioned are, you know, similar at the, the ground level for me. You know, um, I used to get a lot of praise in my brigade because I had the largest cash for work program, CFW. Right, we know what that is, uh, all three of us. CFW should have been called cash for pretending to work, CFPW. I paid a lot of people to pretend to work and I pretended to care. It was actually kind of a nice situation. I always thought it was interesting that I could barely walk off my base without getting ambushed by machine gun fire. If I walked 50 to 100 more meters, there would already be buried IEDs, which was weird because our towers should have seen it, but they were pretty good at it. And yet every single Friday... Lieutenant Jordan Rich, my fire support officer, was getting married in two days. I'm literally flying to San Diego for this tomorrow. He was my fire support officer, which meant he was also in charge of civil affairs, right? Danny knows in the Army. FSOs do that. And so he would pay between 1,000 and 1,300 Afghans to work or pretend to work. And they would form a line. I mean, it was a single file line. It was kind of incredible. And we'd go serpentine and we'd go like maybe a mile. Now, the Taliban would attack us within feet of leaving our gate with regularity. Daily regularity, almost daily. Sometimes we'd make it 100 meters if we were lucky. And it was early enough in the morning and the Taliban doesn't like fight in the dark or when they're tired, luckily. Nevertheless, Payday, midday, not one time did the Taliban attack that line. Now, you would think as collaborators, that'd be their number one target. Matt's point holds. I knew they were in on it. I mean, because I paid certain village elders as foremen. Kind of amazing that we had that system, isn't it? It's bizarre almost. It's like a built-in corruption formula but nevertheless we had four men and they were to be the village elders and they didn't pick up a spade obviously because they were important but what would happen is i knew in my heart those guys were paying off the taliban so i'm funding the taliban which was great because i just liked the fact that most fridays there wasn't a lot of violence but it's instructive i mean it speaks to the edifice of a war that was built on castles of sand and mirages fantasy from the start and so when we talk about the money i mean what how do we even talk about the money do we talk about the money we threw away every week i mean i had a backpack cash just like matt did it's absurd we stole none of it by the way we should have stolen so much money me and my 
<laughs> Bunny Jordan, who I'm going to watch get married in two days, our big joke is, why didn't we steal? Matt, Danny, how easily would it be to steal? <laughs> I had a guy who used to draw a chicken, a tiny little chicken next to his name when he had a sign, because they're, not, because they're illiterate. He used to draw this beautiful chicken, like in the small line. And I'm thinking, I could probably draw a chicken for like 50 or 50 guys. I'm not particularly artistic, but I bet I could find a soldier who is, and he'll do it, because I'm a captain, right? Point is, the whole thing is absurd. But how do we talk about money? And I'll, I'll stop here, and I, I never stop when I say I'm going to stop. But that's one kind of money that got wasted. And it's an enormous amount of money. And then I think about the contracts, like when I had to get an airfield and I paid a guy $120,000, local guy. So probably, what, 40 that went to the Taliban. Also, he did a bad job. Also, I don't remember there being any real bidding. Also, I remember basically every federal law about how contracts should work wasn't even addressed. And oh, by the way, none of that matters because the real money that was worth mentioning is the blood money, the merchants of death money. I mean, there's lots of great stories about toilet seats that cost $1,000. People love that. People resonate with that. They do, right? That's a great story. Man, I wish that was the worst of it. I mean, the real money is that war is profitable. That war is profitable. Uh, I looked into this when I did a study of every lieutenant colonel and above. Sorry, Danny. In command of a battalion and above. I only looked at the battalion commanders. Lord knows you would have been one if you weren't courageous. Point is, I looked at every single battalion and above commander, wrote an article about it who was in Afghanistan when I was in Afghanistan. And I did a study on this, and what I found out is that almost every one of them is somehow complicit in the military industrial complex, walking through a revolving door, earning that blood money through the merchants of death, and the Americans don't care. The people don't care. It's completely hidden, but it runs our Congress. It drives an imperial presidency because it's a lot easier for one man to make the call for us to go to war. And here's the worst of it all. The Afghan war can end. Even the Iraq and Syria war can end, and there's no indication that they will. The real money, the real money, and Danny writes about this a lot. He writes about Taiwan. He writes about the South China Sea. He sees stuff other people don't see. And I read everything he writes. But this is important. The real money is in cold wars. The real money is in F-35s and in Abrams tanks we don't need and in wars we shouldn't fight. The big ticket items. And I think that what really strikes me about it is that when we talk about money, what resonates with the American people is the absurd stories I could tell you. And I've only touched on. But the real money is in forever militarism. And that, I think, deserves a certain amount of attention because even if the war on terror ended, and it won't, because it's convenient, American militarism exists. And I think that the value of an organization like this is it looks at the root problems. And with that, I'll stop. Well, we've got a lot of, a lot of our board members here uh, um, tonight. Who wants to jump in here? Uh, Ivan? Dell, uh, I would. Uh, uh, oh, okay. Uh, I just want to ask a simple question. You've uh, said a lot of things. Money corrupts. Uh, you know the ar the Afghan army was foreigners, etc. But what's the main reason that we lost? Because I'm not sure. What, so I heard one general say, retired general say, we didn't fight one 20 year war. We fought 21 years. 21 year wars, meaning that the military cycles through to get punch tickets rather than, you know, staying in one place and getting to know everybody and continuing to get to, you know, continuing those relationships, they get shipped out or whatever. So I've heard a lot of uh, uh, reasons. And, and this is the second war, which I know you're all involved in. And that is, what's the narrative? Why did we lose? What was the main reason? And I come to the conclusion that it was impossible to win because it just the nature of um, counterinsurgency warfare, na nation building, is that 
the, the fact that the, the military can fight uh, formidable enemies on a set, you know, set piece battlefield. But when, they, when we get into these brush fire wars that are more mainly political, we, we have a problem. So, and I think we, you, you explored some of those problems in suit, including that our generals and, and if the generals don't know anything about the culture of the place, the people down below probably learn the hard way about the culture. So I think that's a major factor, but I would just wonder what your impression of why did we lose or was it impossible to win? Because it seems like we did, we saw Vietnam, we waited what is whatever, how many years after that, 25 years or whatever, and got into it again in, to, twice. And if you count Libya, when they, when they saw what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan, and then they uh, pulled the top off that regime. They didn't go in on the ground in heavy amounts. Uh, but, I mean, we continue to make the same mistake. So it's very important to learn what the main reason or reasons uh, uh, why this went why this went wrong. Yeah, I, I actually want to jump in on that one right away. That that whole uh, twenty one year wars is one of H. R. McMaster's famous favorite sayings because it uh, and a lot of the generals also because it basically allows you to uh, not take any responsibility for what happened. It wasn't because we made mistakes. It was because of this systemic. Uh, you know, we had to relearn everything. That implies that if you had had longer tours, three years, four years, something like that, that that would have made a difference. No, that would have made no difference whatsoever because it was fundamentally a militarily unattainable objective. That was the whole the whole issue. When we first went in there, whether you liked the issue or not, Bush sent us into Afghanistan, but he gave the military a militarily attainable mission, which was to uh, damage the Taliban and to harm uh, Al Qaeda's ability to launch t uh, attacks against the United States, and that was absolutely accomplished by March of 2002. Now, by all rights, we should then have, even a few months later, have left because there was no enemy left. There was uh, Al Qaeda had been scattered in the four winds, mostly gone into Pakistan, where we don't have any troops, never did. Uh, so at that point, the war should have ended. Instead, Bush changed it into a nation-building war, and then Obama doubled down on that. And by nature, by very definition, those are not militarily attainable objectives. You can't nation build. What does that even mean? Meaning that there's no uh, criteria by which the war will ever end. And so it never does because you use these, uh, uh, these ethereal terms like improvement and mo momentum, which Petraeus was his favorite term to use, which can't be measured. It can't be counted. So you don't know if you're winning or losing or whatever. So you just conduct tactical tasks. You just do stuff. You send this unit over there. They do not rage. They they have this hel helicopter insertion fight here. They they do these presence patrols, whatever. Fill in the blank. Uh, build build houses and roads and everything else. But it doesn't ever lead to anything, and so it never did. And that's why as bad of a job as Biden did pulling us out, it was absolutely the right thing because it was never ever going to change. Uh, uh, Thank you. We had Patton and Dell. And Del. um, thank you, John. I want to thank the, the three honorees for their wonderful service to the Republic. I loved Ray McGovern's comments, which were terrific. Um, Danny, you mentioned the fetish about the military, and I think that's a guilt that comes out of the uh, the Vietnam War after that we ended the draft, and I think that was because they wanted to keep the political class from opposing some of these adventures that they wanted to get into. Um, and and so, I don't know whether bringing the draft back would, would help. I'd like some comment on that. But the other <coughs> thing that was a very hopeful sign, I was watching PBS one night, and they showed them um, like lieutenant governors in some of these states and in the states, I didn't realize we had all these National Guard units over in these wars. And there seems to be a real objection from some of the state officials that are higher up to say, we don't want those kids pulled off and sent off to war unless it's declared by Congress. So is there any comment on either of those as ways to, to, to put brakes on these wars that are, 
that are that, that are ruining the country and and um, and ruining families. Uh, I mean, I, I was so touched by your comments about what it means to a family to lose a, a son or a daughter. So I, on those, I'd like some comment. The back uh, yeah. and, and keeping the National Guard units out of these yeah. wars declared by Congress. Well, yeah, let me just jump, uh, Pat, uh, when, when, Pat, when I was, uh, uh, when I was an undergraduate at Harvard, a uh, uh, number of people, over 100 people, took over the administration building, and we had the draft then. And, uh, uh, you know, now uh, at the last reunion, uh, <clears throat> they listed uh, the, the concerns that people had, and war was number 10. Yeah. So I, I think your point about taking uh, uh, war off the table for the elites really uh, – you know, the draft definitely did that. But Bruce, you want to jump in and uh, and, and and say that that it's uh, what's your comment about the draft? No, I think that surely the draft is what pushed uh, the issue very personally to the elites. You know, the Robert McNamara's and the elites sitting around and they got to answer to their kids, uh, and they can't tell lies to their kids, and that's clearly, I think, was seminal in awakening you know the united states uh to finally the opposition to the vietnam war and that uh, to have a draft combined with an obligation that none of the draftees will be sent to war without a declaration by congress is what we need um history shows us that congress will not declare war except in apparent self-defense uh they wouldn't even take up uh, Obama's request to declare war against Syria. Even the Tom Cottons and Ted Cruz's wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. Um, and, I, I did ask and, uh, Danny and, and Matt, when, when President Bush in his second State of the Union message said it was his goal to purge tyranny from the face of the earth, he was going to perfect mankind. <laughs> what did you think of, of that statement? Oh. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, at least for me, it, it, it's like, man, that's 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 uh, again, it's a militarily unattainable task. It's it's just an uh, an aspiration. It, you, you an aspiration is not a military objective. You can't tell you can't tell a, an infantry battalion take that hill and and you know, okay, you can't even fill in the blank. You can't even finish that. So that's that's just means there will never be an end to the war because you. You can't do that unless you get rid of all the people because, you know, there's a lot of us that have an evil side. Did you have a military statement that you can't kill your way out of a war? Is that accurate? Yeah, unfortunately, Petraeus was the famous one to say that. He kept saying over and over, you can't kill your way out of war. And, and McChrystal would say, you can't you know, kill your way out of this insurgency. And then that's exactly what they tried to do. They didn't do anything besides that or anything that mattered. So, it's accurate, but it's unfortunately the guys who said it the most were the ones who violated it the most. Dell, yeah. you get Dell, you get the last word here. Uh, do you? Oh, all right, you wanna... I'll, I'll take it. I, I I would like. There's a lot I can say about the draft, having been uh, ASA MNRA for uh, six years, but I won't. It takes much too long. Uh, I would like to commend these three great young men, not only for the exercise of extraordinary bravery, but also for the fact uh, that they have continued to create fantastic analysis, credibility to the cause that they exercise that bravery for. And I, I'm the, I, I, I'm the only brother at the table here tonight. I want to talk to white men just a minute. The system, our system, our imperial impulse from the very beginning sought to diminish the activities of young people of integrity and bravery that we've seen demonstrated here. That has been a tremendous detriment to the country. Those guys, those people who's, who are lost to history in the real cancel culture that has gone on, 
those people and those institutions could have been this and can still be the bridge between young black guys and young white guys for, for mutual respect because of the issues and the way they operated and acted. So that the three young guys here, I, I, I hope you survive. I hope it is important to you to survive. You have a story to tell, which is gonna be more and more cogently accepted. I, I suspect if we've got anything left in us by, by the people who experience what you have seen so that I hope, I really hope that in these coming days that the kind of bravery that has been exhibited by you and people like you throughout history can have a greater resonance in this country. We have to start building around a new narrative and there's no narrative any better than the guys who, and women, who exercised extraordinary bravery and dissidents in favor of the first principles that should be the part of any new nation. And at, 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 that's me for the afternoon. Thank, thank, thank you, Dell. It's very, very eloquent and uh, very fitting uh, finish here. So. Uh, Thank you guys for being who you are, and uh, we really uh, let's 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 keep it up. Well, well, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Danny. Danny, yeah. sure. thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. Nice. Really appreciate this. Good luck, guys. Uh, Which we quit on Ray, that. Ray, Ray, good night to you, and uh, your occasion to sin. No? It's a <laughs> cat, cat. That's the anger. Yeah, the anger and the occasion to sin. <laughs> Right. You know, Ray, um, I had shared this with Bruce and John earlier today that, um, you know, in court, I never hated anyone on the other side. I never hated anyone within the Iraqi insurgency or within the Af uh, Afghan insurgency, the Taliban. I never hated them. Um, but I hated people on our side. I hated people in my chain of command. I hated people in our government. I hated other officers who did not do their job. I hated those above me who, again, did not do their job, uh, to just put it simply. So we, your words about anger um, were, were, were taken, uh, I think, as you intended. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, well, sir. well, thank I'm you. Off, John. Be disciplined. Just okay, thank you. We're